Mount Everest. First, a brief about Mr. Ali. He hails from Hajo, Central Assam. He is an alumnus of Sainik School, Gualmara, and an engineering graduate from Jorhat Engineering College. He is settled in the USA and a software engineer by profession in Silicon Valley, California. He submitted Everest from Nepal along with a group of 11 members, of which two others were in year two. Mr. Ali has also submitted Mount Ekonomua, the highest peak in South America. It is the highest mountain in the Americas, the highest outside Asia, and the highest in the Southern Hemisphere, with a summit elevation of 6,961 meters. In the past, he has also climbed Mount Elbrus, the highest peak in Europe, and Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest in Africa. It is situated in the western part of the Caucasus and is the highest peak of the Caucasus mountains. Mount Kilimanjaro is in fact a dormant volcano in Tanzania. It is in fact the highest in Africa. We now request our General Secretary to kindly felicitate our distinguished guest of the evening, Mr. Hidayat Ali, in the traditional Asmic style, ma'am please. General Secretary Ma'am to kindly felicitate Mr. Ali with a Horai. <clears throat> On behalf of the Kalini Club, we would like to present Mr. Ali with a memento, which shall be given away by both AGS and GS of Kalini Club. Thank you. Thank you. And as a thanks for being here on this auspicious occasion today and gracing us with his presence, we request AJ Sir to kindly felicitate Hedayat Ali Sir with a bouquet and a soul. We also Welcome Mrs. Jyoti Ali, better half of Mr. Hedayat Ali, and thank her to be with us here. Thank you. Now we shall be starting with an informal Q&A session with Hedayat Ali, sir. So would you join us here, please? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Sir, rising to 8,848 meter altitude, the altitude at which almost all the commercial planes fly is undoubtedly a challenging task. And I really congratulate you, sir, for achieving this feat. Thank you. So, the basic question. What inspired you to get into this field? Uh, actually, I have to go about 30 years back. Uh, I was in class 9 in Sunday School, Golpada. And I went for a trekking camp in Sikkim. Uh, and that's the first time when I saw the Himalaya. And that trekking camp was for 3 weeks. And by the, by the time of that trekking camp, and right, uh, I was really felt something like, okay, uh, this is something I, if I able to in my life, I want to really come back and really want to uh, do a, at that time it was not really Mount Everest, I was not knowing too much about the Everest, but I was in, it will become a dream, I want to come back and at least climb one of the mountain. Uh, that was the first dream I had. So fast forward, uh, move, move, move in the life. Then I graduated from Azura Engineering College, went to state, 
got married and become father of three children. And now they are kind of grown up. Uh, so my elder son is 19 years, uh, another son 17 years, and a daughter 11 years. So my daughter born in 2010, and this after 2010, uh, I was getting more time actually. Uh, starting 2012, um, I was thinking something about my own own time and own dream, and immediately the dream of coming back to the Himalaya and try to uh, climb the Everest. Actually, by the time when I came back from the trekking camp, I started reading a lot of books about the Himalaya, and I was fascinated by the story of many climbers who did. So that time I was thinking of uh, going back to the Himalaya. But uh, I was 42 years old that time. And, and the second thought was that uh, am I kind of crazy? Or I was really kind of uh, like laughing at myself, like 42 years and trying to like dream of climbing Everest. Uh, but uh, I'll say like God grace, another thought came in mind. Uh, this is my dream. Uh, I should at least give it a try. So that was my initial thought. Like I never thought I'll be really one day I'll stand top of the world. But initial thought was to just to give it a try. So then what I start doing, like I start doing uh, physical fitness preparation. And at the same time, I was reading a lot of books, um, basically motivational book and biography of many successful people, uh, trying to understand like what exactly I need to do and what kind of uh, character I need to develop and what kind of method I need to follow to achieve this dream. So after reading many books, uh, I basically learned two things. Uh, first thing is like uh, any hard goal, right? Maybe in mountain. Anything on a, your academic sense, right? Uh, career, uh, there is no shortcut. So that is the first thing I learned. Uh, second thing, uh, I need to follow a process. Basically, whenever any hard dream, uh, we need to break down that hard goal into small, uh, small pieces. So if your dream is for, say, your goal is like it take maybe say many years, right? Uh, it will be really hard to achieve if you just thinking of only your final goal, but what you need to learn how to break down that goal into small pieces and how to execute those goals. So basically uh, your goal is now coming to a weekly goal and you are just trying to achieve the weekly goal. So that's the way you are just going, climbing one step at a time. Uh, so I spent about five years just to increase my fitness and that's for my physical fitness and mental fitness. Uh, mental on the mental business first thing I was trying to uh, learn how to be in, in the course it's very difficult for a long run you'll get a lot of frustration uh, you'll whatever you are doing sometimes you're expecting more you may not get your result so I was trying to learn how to be in this stay, stay in the course that's uh, the first learning so after five years I was little bit confident like uh, maybe uh, I should go to the next step. Then first thing what I did is I like, start hiking some of the uh, difficult hike in India. And after completing those, uh, I was actually feeling very confident uh, seeing my fitness level gone up. Then next phase I was thinking was, uh, am I able to cope with high altitude? Uh, usually you may be very fit, but when you go to the high altitude where your oxygen is less, uh, your body may not be react the way you want. So you need to first experiment with that. So first thing what we did is like, uh, one time we, we went for a travel to Peru. Uh, Peru has a lot of big mountains. Uh, so one of the mountains called Huan Pico. Uh, it was like a 12,000 feet. So that's, I thought like maybe I should try that first. And that's the first mountain, actually a little height I tried. And I was a little confident on that. So after that, I went to the next step um, and I was for me. And on the same year, I went to the Kilimanjaro and submitted to the Kilimanjaro. So I was a little getting confidence. Then I went to Elboros, which is the highest mountain in the Europe. And I was also able to uh, submit that one. And then after that, 
Uh, I went to the Ankagwa. Ankagwa is the highest mountain outside of the Himalaya, uh, about 7,000 meters. So along with that, my teammate, uh, I was 49 that time, 48 actually that time. And my teammate, uh, we had, I had three teammates, which were kind of half of my age, like one is 22, another 23 and 25. And I was actually able to climb with them all the way to the top. Uh, coming back, I was a little injured. But that was like one of my biggest confidence building. Like then I thought like okay, yeah, I was able to compete with them, and I was really happy. And and then I thought like maybe I'm ready for the Everest. Maybe I should give it a try. Uh, once I come back home, uh, my biggest challenge was fear. Um, I actually fear a lot. Like uh, I even thought okay, if I go to the Everest, uh, you might have know a lot of stories. People uh, people. Died there. So my fear is like, okay, if I go, what will happen to if I die? What will happen to my body? What will happen to my children? What will happen to my wife? How they will survive? Those kind of all fear. Uh, it took actually almost one year just to overcome that fear. So many times I sleep at the night uh, thinking that, okay, tomorrow I'll sign up, this year I'll go. Uh, by morning when I get up, see my wife face or children, my kid face, right? Uh, immediately whatever determination you had last night, everything is gone. So it took me almost one year. Uh, I started reading a lot of other books, philosophical books, even I never read like Quran also, <laughs> I read the Quran. But I was just trying to understand what is the meaning of life. Uh, that's one. Uh, so I read a lot of books, then what I understood myself is like, okay, if you have something you want to really want to do, you are passionate about that, you should do it. Uh, you may lose your life, but that's that's the ultimate purpose because you die with your purpose. So that, that, that was the message I got from reading from different books. And at the same time, I was learning how to use my fear for my advantage. So when you go for a Everest, you have to do a lot of exile to tell something about more preparation. But, uh, Many times uh, I get lazy, like, okay, today, like, my mind becomes some kind of a story, like, they tell, okay, you have this friend, this friend, but I start learning how to use that fear. So basically, I fear that, okay, if I don't do it today, so basically I'm going to step back and I may never come back. So I start learning that how to use the fear for my advantage. So that was that. So ultimately, I signed up last year, 2001. Uh, COVID was there, but when I signed up around Mars, it was almost normal. So I thought, okay, this may be a good time. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of already, already kind of prepared mentally and physically. I should go. I should not delay because if you delay, then maybe you don't know tomorrow what another thought may come. So I signed up for that. Then I came uh, to Kathmandu last week of April last year. It was good. Then we went to Pakistan. Uh, the COVID second wave hit hard. Uh, it was not only India and Nepal. It hit hard in that Everest also. And out of my team, we are nine. Nine. Five of them need to be one day uh, rescue from the. Uh, we need to call the helicopter and rescue them. And I was also sick. Actually, everybody was sick. Uh, so everybody was, was trying to recover. So I did not come in the first day. So I thought like, uh, actually in Everest expedition, it's hard to sign up. Once you sign up, it's really hard to quit also because you have put a lot of effort on that. Uh, so I did not really uh, quit in the first time. So what I did, I came for a one week uh, below, below so that I can recover. Uh, I was a little bit impatient in this, uh, this time. I was thinking I was missing a lot of things in the top. Uh, I did not recover fully, but my mind was there, I was impatient, I went back, uh, but I could not, uh, then I went, try to go up. Means uh, you came down to the base camp? Base camp, from base camp I came down another two days below, okay. just to recover. Then from below camp, I went back. Uh, when I look back, uh, I think it was my impatience. Uh, so I went back, then I tried to go back up, I went half, then I was really uh, tired and I was thinking, uh, maybe it's time to quit. I'm putting too much on myself on danger. Plus, uh, on 
Everest, you have a team, you have your own self and then you have other people. Uh, anything happens, everybody try to help each other. I was thinking, maybe I'm also putting them in danger. So then initially my thought was, I'll go down, I'll take two days rest and I'll decide. Uh, I came down, uh, next day it was more. Uh, so I, I was also having same thing with my other, other colleagues. So one day morning, early morning, uh, they called the helicopter, packed my bag, put me there. <laughs> uh, that time uh, Kathmandu was fully locked down. So another ambulance was waiting, helicopter came, took me ambulance and took to one of the hospital there. Yeah. So it was like a war room situation, lot of COVID patients some, somewhere in the floor. So I, I spent about one week, then I got tested negative. Then I flew back to home with broken heart and broken body. Then about one month, I was able to recover quick, physically recover quick. Uh, mentally it was really, I was disappointed, like uh, I came back, uh, that was like almost eight years has gone on this preparation and for last two years, Everest was on my head every day, like every moment, like I was morning, first thing I think about Everest, night, uh, every time, and I was really disappointed. Then one day, uh, one day I was thinking like, uh, I think I was putting more drama myself, and I had two choice, I have to just um, either I quit, just move on in a life. Uh, second, I was thinking, uh, I already put like eight years on that. And now, just give one try, so I quit. So that was my question in the head. And at the same time, I was thinking maybe I should give another try. Maybe I may be example for my kid, my children. Uh, one day they may like uh, think, okay, my father, uh, they will also try. So that was the second thought. Uh, I, then I decided, I'll go. Then I start preparing for that. So first thing I was thinking, what are the mistakes I have done last time? And what I learned from that and how to correct on that. So I'm just giving one example just to the kind of preparation you needed for a uh, Last time I had uh, some cough, uh, which is because of like, uh, after research, I find that I was doing more breathing to mouth rather than nose. And when you do a lot of breathing to mouth, mouth in the higher altitude, the more air goes uh, drier and causes some pain. So to train my brain for last year, uh, it's kind of a little funny, like I used to put my head in a night in my mouth, so that I start training my brain to uh, take a breath from the nose. So that was the, just I'm just giving one example. Lot of things you need to prepare, it's a really hard preparation. So that thing actually really worked this time. So I... Like BMC basic mountaineering course or advanced mountaineering course? Uh, no, actually I've never taken any, any course on mountaineering. But uh, last year I had a course which basically guided me on the aerobics. Uh, aerobics is like your efficiency to heart endurance. Uh, that's the course I have. Okay. No, no one can in any course. So before uh, scaling the Everest, your first uh, mountaineering expedition was at South America? Uh, no, actually, uh, first my Peru. Peru. Uh, Peru. Uh, then Kiliman uh, Everest Base Camp, uh, that area. Uh, then uh, Kiliman Elbows, then on the south end. Okay. So I need to ask you something. Uh, regarding the expedition, let's assume that in this Everest scale, you had a team of 11. Okay. Those all of them were participants? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, I was a little lucky because of my last year experience, uh, experience, experience on failure, and my experience on, uh, on Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, I was the team leader of one, like uh, we had a 14 member uh, from 10 different countries and I was leading that team and initial summit window, we 11 went there, uh, God grace 11 submitted and all came back in a good hand. Uh, so what I wanted to know was from, let's say you scale from the average base camp at Nepal, mm -hmm. so the local support, what exactly is the local support given to the mountaineers? 
Uh, you have to. I mean, I wanted. I mean, I wanted to ask. Like, let's assume that in the every space camp, you will be having a few people who yeah. shall be supplying with you with their abilities. Yeah. Are there people at all the camps? Camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four. Uh, yes. Uh, so, every base camp is like a city uh, during April. The whole area become a, like a camp city, it's an international camp city. Uh, have some photos like it's like a, about one one and a half kilometer long. You see, it's a top of a glacier. Lot of lot of camps and all the facilities are there. Uh, there'll be dining, cook food. You'll get a good 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 cook food. Uh, you'll have your own own tent, a sleeping tent. Uh, there is a like a toilet, a big toilet, and even like you can do a shower. A shower like a, they will boil some water, give in a bucket, so you take a, uh, you can take a bath. Uh, but once you go up, your facilities are limited. Camp two is very basic. Uh, it's a top of a ice. Uh, you have a tent. There is an open toilet and very limited food. Uh, camp two actually is in a rock, uh, so they have a little better facility. But above camp camp two, uh, camp three is in uh, actually it's in a uh, uh, in area of a mountain. Uh, even to go out, you have to use uh, clip your uh, clip yourself to a rope like a fixed rope because it's easy to sleep and a uh, lot of people actually died also. So in any time you are there, you uh, you are in clip. Uh, camp four very limited facility. Tent is there, but you don't stay for long. A camp for is more of a staging camp, or if you are really tired, you can sleep for one night. But usually, uh, it's above the 8,000 feet. Uh, it's called a dead zone, uh, where usually human body like your cells are not growing. Uh, usually, start, if you spend long time, your cells are start dying there. So, the one of the critical part of the average is to minimize the time above that 8,000 8, meter. So, uh, during once you start using the supply of oxygen in your cylinder, you cannot be, you know, you stopping it if you, let's say, are resting in a camp or something. Ah, no. Uh, once you start, uh, uh, you are basically mercy of that system. Right? Uh, only time you take out, like you, like uh, when you are taking out water, uh, you take, then, uh, you take a sleep, then put your oxygen mask, same thing with the eating. Uh, you take a spoon of say food, then eat. And put the oxygen mask on. So you are fully dependent on that system. And so, who exactly are the people who maintain those camps? Because so the participants are, they will be coming, they will be leaving in a couple of hours. So there must be people who uh, perhaps maintaining those camps. Yeah, uh, so usually, uh, Everest is a very commercial logistic operation. Uh, so usually, there are certain companies all over the world, they conduct the Everest expedition. So you become member of them. So basically, pay, the, uh, pay whatever fees they require. Uh, they are the one. They are people. Uh, people who maintain the infrastructure. They the put put the camps. They put the camps, and all the responsibility with them. And with you, they are going to use one Sherpa. Uh, he'll be your guide. He'll be guiding you in all the places because you are going. You don't know a lot of things there. You don't know not the route. You don't know the all the safety. And they'll be the one who will be always with you, and will be they'll be the one who will guide you. And they are also expert in the oxygen system where to maintain what. So, do you uh, communicate with some sign language? Because with the oxygen mask on, maybe it is difficult to speak. Uh, so no, actually, uh, when we start putting the oxygen, uh, oxygen, uh, you talk with the Sherpa. Then uh, basically, in any problem you show some sign, and there's a problem. Uh, actually, I had a big problem on the summit day. Uh, before last step is called the Hillary step. Uh, Hillary step. So I take out the oxygen mask uh, for a little long time. Uh, so I get to drink the water. So I drink the, once I drink the water, I took the oxygen mask back. So I was feeling like somebody is really putting uh, some kind of clothes in my mouth and trying to kill me. Like I, I could not be. I was really like kind of tense and trying to breathe. And here and there, like I was, then I I really thought like I'll be here forever, like and then I was like even my um, my wife and my children, uh, all the images are coming. Then I immediately Sarpa was there. I called him. I uh, sign language. And I was saying that I was having some problem. So he then I was able to calm down a little bit, 
and I was able to oxygen and he came then he give his oxygen for some time then we are trying uh, start trying to uh, see uh, trying to debug the problem or what is really happening here then we find out that like when I take out uh, the vapor from my mouth right my breath uh, it went to one of the valve and it froze and basically the oxygen is oxygen yes. not coming so then we are able to clean it then uh, I was able to uh, so what's the cost of average expedition? Uh, it will cost you a lot. Uh, in US dollar is like a, about at least like a 50,000 to like it may go like 100,000 uh, US dollar. Uh, there is a lot of reason. Uh, one reason is like for Nepal government, it's a big source of revenue. Uh, the fee for average expedition you have to pay to Nepal government is about like 14 to 15,000 dollars. So that's the fee. Uh, second fee, second expedition is your oxygen. If by a cylinder of oxygen, uh, that will cost you around like maybe 200 dollars if you buy for a hospital or like maybe 100 dollars. But that oxygen needs to be carried here. So the cost of oxygen is about like uh, six to six to one thousand dollar. So you need for your team, you need you need for you, then you need for yourself. Huh? So you will be using at least like a ten to thirteen oxygen per liter. So that's the another big cost. So that expedition is for about one and a half month to two, two months. So fooding, logging, everything. Then there will be one Sherpa always with you. Uh, he'll be your guy. So there is a fee for guy. So all together comes around like uh, 50 to 100,000 USD. So do any company sponsor such expeditions? A uh, lot of times some company uh, sponsor, sponsor, but in my case, uh, actually uh, one principle I have is like, uh, so whenever you take any sponsorship, uh, usually there will be some ex external pressure on you. Suppose you are really want to quit, uh, you may push too much on Everest also. Usually there is a proverb in Everest saying that uh, if you don't push, you don't get in the top. But if you too much, too push it, uh, it will be like one way journey. Reason being like you should be able to make a clear judgment uh, when you are crossing your limit. That's very important. Uh, so if you get, take money from anyone, uh, there will be always some pressure on that. I should always be, if I want to quit, I should, I should be able to quit, I should be able to judge myself without any external person. So I never trust to any company or any work for money. So there are two routes to reach average. One is to Nepal and the other one is to Tibet. Right. So what's the difference between these two routes, like difficulty levels, be it the steepness or the distance? Uh, I have gone only one side, but I have uh, talked with a lot of people who climb from both sides. Uh, there is an advantage and disadvantage in both sides. Uh, Nepal, uh, biggest advantage is like uh, the climatization process is long. So we start climbing because we have a tracking, uh, tracking up to base camp. So it's a slow climatization. Uh, that's actually good for your body. Uh, second is uh, Nepal allow helicopter to fly on uh, Everest. Uh, helicopter can go up to camp too. So any emergency, uh, your life life may save the biggest fear as for Everest, but other mountain, it was just general anxiety going to the new place and doing something new. Because there are many people. And my second son also went with me when he was, he was 13. And last year actually she also went all the way to the top. <laughs> so there, there is some kind of like a woman in the home and my uh, second son, he's a good runner also. Uh, I think he completed recently a long run, about like uh, five minutes, I think 30 seconds uh, per mile. Uh, per mile is actually very good. <laughs> I think ma'am deserves an applause here. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Sir, how do you manage your work with your passion since you work in a shop, software firm? Yeah, actually, uh, it's really challenging. Uh, so what I learned, like the uh, best thing I learned when I started monitoring, I need to give a lot of time. Uh, so I started learning about the time management. A uh, lot of books I also read on the time management and productivity. Uh, 
actually it helps in certain way. I'll just give you an example. Suppose you have some work, you have a flight at 6 o'clock evening. Uh, somehow, uh, because you have a flight at 6 o'clock evening, right? Somehow your work is get done that day because you have some kind of target at the evening, right? So uh, actually same thing is happening to me. So I always like kind of, uh, I look forward to the evening. So I try to do as much work as possible as, as soon as possible. Uh, that's one. Uh, second, uh, lot of time uh, for last two years to work from home. Uh, so what I do usually, suppose that day my plan is to like run, run, right? So what I do, right from the morning, I just dress up and sit and do the office, <laughs> office only and wear the top, top like a lot of time you come into the camera. So I am maybe wearing a shirt, but uh, the boot is like my just in the side with the sword. So I am ready like, so when, whenever I am done, then I don't feel lazy, like, uh, okay, I need to again dress up and this thing, because you already dress up, so somehow you are motivated, it, uh, you can go. <laughs> okay, so now the most essential and the secret behind all successful clients. Sir, your fitness mantra and also your nutrition regime, because fitness is the most important, besides the sound willpower. Uh, fitness, I would say, like uh, when initially I started, I was impatient. Usually, like fitness become like now it's a big marketing industry. So a lot of time you said uh, ad, you will see like uh, people are coming with a lot of like ad. And the way it came like uh, it's kind of a lot of excitement. Uh, people uh, you will see the ad like people doing a lot of heavy stuff like you know running and sweating. There's a lot of music, right? Then you think, okay, I also need to do this kind of uh, uh, this kind of exercise, right? So usually, what people do, they come, they are fully motivated. Uh, one week first, first day they will do little, second day they will do not lot of them, third day they will lot of them. After fourth day, uh, every muscle will pain, everywhere will pain. Uh, by fourth day, you think, okay, today a lot of pain. So fifth day. Uh, you take a rest, another two, three days you'll go, after that and you'll never come back because it's really hard. hard. So usually fitness does not happen that way. So it's a first thing what, what is needed is to develop a habit. Uh, habit in the sense like uh, you should think in a way it's a part of your life. The morning you wake up, brush your teeth, right? So uh, you should think of a long, long, long run. Uh, when I say long run, uh, your body is there, you need a fitness for long. Uh, so, first thing is patience. Uh, then second thing is, you need to study the small. So I'll just give you an example. Uh, suppose, first day you want to run for two, two kilometer, three kilometer, it will not happen. So, you'll, it can happen, but you will not be able to sustain for long. So the way to start is like, uh, you, you need to first study the, suppose you are not doing anything, uh, first, first step is to say you need to take a like 15 to 30 minutes from your daily life for your own own time. So that 30 minutes, say you started your work, right? Uh, say you are doing that one work in an animal, you are doing for 30 minutes, right? Uh, that you do for at least for one month. And one day you need to stop and see like, uh, suppose that day if you are stop, and that day if you feel like you are missing something, then uh, that's the signal that this habit is forming on you. Uh, because this becomes like your routine thing, and you are not doing that, you are feeling you are feeling something missing. So that habit formation is very important. I started very small. Then now uh, it's become easy for to 30 minutes, say you make one round, right? I take a 30 minutes, next step maybe either increase to maybe maybe 10 percent, 20 percent, not to like uh, from say 2 kilometer, not to 4 kilometer, maybe another half kilometer, or you try to reduce the time. So 30 minutes you take, uh, can you do in 25 minutes? Say you are doing for 1 month, 25 minutes, can you reduce it for 5 minutes? So you need to follow a step by step, for a step. And suppose you are, you are doing for 25 minutes, right? Uh, then can you increase it? Now, after walking, uh, you will slowly feel fitness, you will feel good. Then, can I start running, right? You start slow running. So that's the way, step way to go. But 
you have to always think of a long run, not to do overdo, overdo on your own exercise. So, and second is, uh, many times you feel lazy, like uh, I, uh, in my whole journey, 50% of time I am motivated and 50% of time not. So I usually follow one very simple, simple formula I call the 10 minutes rule. So many times like my brain say, okay, today like uh, you have done a lot of work, some story in my mind usually brain. So what I do, I usually think of a one way. Uh, what I do, uh, can I go just 10 minutes? Uh, that's only I think of. Then I go for 10 minutes. Uh, if you're really sick or really you are tired, you're not able to go more than 10 minutes, you'll come back. But 90% of time it's like a brain, this is like making all the time your stories, right? Not to go. Then suppose you go 10 minutes, right? Then you think of maybe can I go 5 minutes? Suppose you go 15 minutes. After going 15, you are not going to call your husband or wife to pick you up, right? So, but you will come back again. Now, you have not done anything. You see at the end you are doing 30 minutes of exercise. So, you need to always think of some hack, hack or some kind of indirect way to motivate yourself. You can continue. Uh, on the diet, uh, I don't, don't eat anything special, never diet. Uh, usually just Assamese diet. Uh, uh, rice, dal, uh, uh, vegetables, sometimes egg, uh, just non-veg, Assamese diet, with two, three days of uh, non-veg. Uh, but uh, after going for here, from here, I just suggest so two things like that help me. Uh, I think as a society in Assam, like, uh, we eat more rice than before actually. The amount of rice we eat, uh, actually more. So what changes I did, I reduced a little bit of say, initially I reduced a 10% of rice uh, with uh, rice. I try to replace it like a dal uh, or sabji or anything else. So slowly I'm reducing the rice, but increasing the other is still the same for uh, Second is, uh, what we do usually, uh, the dinner is the last thing we do. We eat a lot of rice, we eat dinner, then we sleep. Uh, I think, uh, I think those who are in medical profession, they will be able to tell more about what is the harmful effect. But what I do like usually, uh, I eat dinner about one hour, one hour before or before sleep. Then I go for at least a little bit of work after that. And I think that two senses help me a lot. And and to another two things I learn uh, usually for Everest, uh, it's very important to have an optimal weight uh, because if you have a more weight. Uh, you need more oxygen, you need to maintain your body more. Uh, more. Uh, in average, if you are bulky, uh, your whole oxygen will be, will, will be wasted on maintaining your body rather than uh, going up. And you may have a massive heart attack because your body, you may not be able to push it. So I was uh, trying to maintain one extreme is kind of weight management is like dieting, you are not anything. Uh, eating, try to eat uh, less everywhere, uh, which is actually not going to sustain for a long time. So you can uh, you can reduce your food, not eat for a uh, few days, but time will come, you will get up, then you will start eating more, because you are feeling like, oh, I have not eaten anything. That anything you see, is you are thinking of eating that one. So I never died. And second is called that calorie counter. Calorie counter is the people like who try to say every calorie and try to see like whether I eat or not. That's also not sustainable. So I think the sustainable way is in between. You need to really control your diet. Uh, you need to control your calorie. But you need to do some, add some exercise. And I think that's the way I think if you maintain that, you can sustain for a long time. If you're not doing average or monitoring, you really don't need a lot of exercise. Uh, you need a lot of body movement, uh, but more it does not mean that you need to go to the gym. Actually, I have never been in uh, gym any time in my life, so most of the time, just I walk, run, uh, outside I like to do. So exercise means not only like uh, walking and that, suppose you are doing something, work, work on the gardening, that also exercise, doing some house also. Usually I do all my housework just to keep myself, so even cutting from grass, uh, washing car, everything I do myself, uh, like I just do, so that I kind of that become pressure on me. I do that physical exercise, uh, physical work, uh, in that you get some exercise.
but uh, many times I think uh, one thing I just like to like again like you don't need to call in all the marketing like gimmicks uh, whoever selling a lot of like shortcut like uh, saying that okay we did this uh, week or this money you lose this uh, those are most of them are like in Bollywood movie uh, where they some somebody will come they try to make your money double and triple in short time very similar to that it will never sustain for long time. So after Everest, which mountain is going to be your next expedition? Uh, it's a hard question. Uh, when I'm in mountain, it's so much pain, then I think like, okay, this is the last, never going to come back. Again, I have a short memory after a few months, like then again, like you feel like okay, you're missing something. Uh, that pain is still there, not fully recovered. Maybe after six months, I'll think. <laughs> and so, what would you suggest to our audience about you know how to travel clean? I mean, keeping a place clean while traveling. I mean, we have heard of places which are you know famous trekking spots in India yeah, and all over the world. Right, yeah. Over a certain period of time, we have heard that those places have been littered with dirt and all. So, during your trekking experiences, how was it that environment was protected? Yeah, actually, in Everest uh, in base camp. Everything uh, that was used there, wasted there, uh, actually been picked up from there, even your, all the human waste. So, usually all the toilets, the way they make it, it's a big toilet, and the only one drowned there, uh, one is full, it's uh, like seal, and they carry it. So, they carry everything from the base camp. But top camp, there are some challenges. Uh, challenges are there because uh, if you are in camp for it, uh, it's really hard to bring anything down. So there are some challenges, but as far as possible, uh, everybody is concerned about the uh, cleanness. Even when you eat something, you never throw anything on. You just keep in the bag or in the pocket. When you come to the base camp, then there are some dustbin. I will put it there. I think uh, it's it's matter of education and self realization And at the same time, I think if there is a trekking spot, if you are not uh, providing a good dustbin, or toilet facilities, right? Uh, I think we need to do both of We need to provide a facility plus education also. Thank you, sir. So I'd like to ask you one thing. Uh, you just happened to mention that with every tractor, there is one Sherpa as a guide. Right. So did the Sherpas share their stories with you? I mean, they must have come to the top a number of times. Right. So, could you share uh, like So, easily, I Sherpa you with you for about like uh, more than one month. Uh, they become your teammate, your brother, kind of. Uh, actually, you are depend on, depend your life on them. And they are it's a kind of team. Uh, many times, many Sherpa die also along with the team member. It's like a team effort. And and you, you kind of talk everything. Like, uh, you, you, you are with him for a long time. So at the end, when the end, the end of the expedition, uh, it becomes sometimes like you don't have anything to talk like you. Even share a lot of your personal details and so they have become your brother something. Man. So now we would like to open the floor for the audience. If the, our audience has any questions, they may raise their hands, I will take the mic. Anybody? Now already we had very good interaction. It's a lot of elaboration. It's really good. However, other than Everest, do you have any other difficult experience in climbing? All are difficult, I know. But then Everest was absolute different. Other than any unforeseen or unexpected situation in any of the climbing. Uh, I'll tell you what was in Everest. Um, uh, Everest, uh, when people die at the top, uh, it's very really difficult to dig it. Uh, so this time when I went, uh, one of my friends uh, who might play, uh, climb last time, uh, he came on 2019 and one of his friends, like I know him kind of indirectly, uh, he died on uh, hill step last year. So this time when I went, uh, I slipped one rock actually and I was about to hit his uh, body in the hill step. And his body is still lying there. Uh, lying there, uh, his, uh, it is about all, already three, three years. Uh, some of his dress are kind of discolored. But 
Uh, his body is intact exactly the way all the gears are there. And you feel like uh, he's kind of he's just taking this, he'll come back. So uh, uh, when, I, when I was really stuck by that, and, but when I went out, uh, my focus was stopped, I didn't think too much. Um, I, I get in there, about five minutes I was feeling good, but immediately uh, that scene has come to me. Uh, then I was really feeling bad, but it helped me uh, in direct way a little motivation also. I was thinking like if I don't really uh, try to go down, go down I will also like him. And, and while coming down, I was trying to not to see like, his face and this thing, but sometimes I do not try to see something. He also actually run runner, and he also run a marathon. So usually uh, we try to like uh, end up support each other. Uh, so no step like I don't need to really tell like her saying that oh I am going, I, you have to give me permission. It's not like that. So uh, uh, I do myself preparation, and uh, I think the whole expedition in short uh, without hard support it was not possible. So that's the way we like it. Because you said that you started uh, thinking or you know, right. considering right. that you will start mountaining at the age of 42. And right. then you took around 6, 7 years to right. mentally and physically prepare yourself. Right. And in the meantime, you also scaled the other mountains right. before going for Everest. Right. And that's why I wanted to know. I mean, what was the journey like? Before, because before Everest, Everest was your first expedition. Right. There must be a number of things you had learned, a number of things maybe that uh, you thought that you won't be able to overcome. Yeah. But you did and you experienced them in those other adventures. So could you shed some light on that one? Yeah. Uh, actually, again, uh, most of the time I try to push myself a little bit and try to, I uh, like really try to, uh, like to, like sometimes put in certain uh, uh, unpleasant situation. Uh, situation uh, so that was my motivation. Uh, so when I started going first mountain, we were together. Like uh, we had for a test for a table, but I thought like this may be a good uh, chance to do some experiment. So they were we they were in a hotel. I were and I took and gone there. But uh, when I I think sign up for the Everest base camp, uh, so she was a little already initially. Uh, she was thinking, uh, instead of going base camp, I'm really going to the uh, more dangerous. And, uh, so you see, was within like a worry. But after that, I think Kilimanjaro, other mountain not, but Everest definitely, she never told me like, don't do what, uh, she tried to hide it. Uh, so that way, like kind of a lucky, she was supporting me. And I kind of say like, she's a brave, brave girl in the sense like, uh, she was the one managing the whole expedition and during my absence, absence uh, and second like this is the kind of expedition uh, when I go like uh, you go like something like you are going really going uh, <laughs> coming back is lucky you think in that way so so I try myself like this prepare and try to she was giving me support uh, so. Uh, I, I think that, that, that's the story. <laughs> and so what about your children? Are they adventure, fond of adventures and you know, stuff like this? Yes, uh, actually yes. Uh, my like uh, two children also follow me a little bit. Uh, uh, I was like uh, every week I go for hiking. Uh, so they also go with me, uh, with me both the children. Uh, uh, there's one very complex... Uh, uh, for how long you took out the mask? Uh, the rule, rule in the Everest is like uh, you have to take the mask for a second and take one picture so that your face comes in photo uh, that's required for the summit. So I just took out. Just for uh, one just put the photo. The Sepa was ready. I just took out. He took the photo and put it back. Yeah. Uh, I want to mention here one thing here. Uh, if you see the dress, uh, the dress is actually custom made. There is a kamosa in the both side. Uh, if you see this one, actually that dress is designed by her. And a lot of the, every expedition I go, I take uh, always some kind of symbol from Masa. And I have just like dress made up and I took one gamosa. Actually you can see below, I tie it in a pair of flag. There's a gamosa there too. Uh, so 
and let students can try climbing this scale. Ah, and yes, scale. Just one more question. And since you said uh, summiting is obviously difficult, and you summit as a team, but like who certifies that yes, this person in the team has submitted, and this person couldn't submit? Like there must be some verifying agency or right. Uh, so there is an organization called Himalayan Himalayan database. They call it Himalayan database. So they maintain the record of the all the submitted. So there are certain rules. Once in the uh, in the peak, uh, first thing is you need to take a photo. And this is back. You see the flag. Uh, that's the top flag. And you can see the topography. People can find out. Uh, then you have to take your marks so that your face is visible. Uh, that's one. Second, when we're in the top, uh, we, we can serve up carries the radio. Uh, they kind of radio from the top saying that we are in the top. And third is it's like a, a GPS tracker. So usually uh, I carry a GPS tracker. So I send a message from there. And that tracker will tell you exactly your height and where you are. So there's some uh, some method of verifying the uh, who has submitted. Uh, your first question about base camp. So if your feet like a, Feet in the sense like uh, I don't know exactly how to measure that, uh, but if you think like you can run two miles or uh, three to three kilometers, and you do your like the physical fitness, general fitness, uh, you'll be able to go to the uh, track to the base camp. But uh, it's very difficult to know unless you experiment yourself how your body reacts to the altitude. So only way to experiment is to go. Some altitude, you can you can always try. If not, you can always come back. Please, sir, do 